Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage, and the title of this lecture is The Conclusion of the Binomial Probability Distribution Lecture. As always, please be an active learner as you watch this video. When we adjourned last time, I left you with this problem. If you solved it, uh, congratulations. If not, I will give you another opportunity to do it here. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. All right, so we uh, were given that 72% of all adult Americans would rather give up chocolate than their cell phones. In a random sample of 10 adult Americans, what is the probability that exactly eight would give up their cell phones? Well, note that this is a binomial experiment and you do verify that it does all the points that we need, uh, but there are 10 independent trials. And we'll define a success as an adult American who would rather give up chocolate um, than their cell phone. Uh, the probability then is from the problem P is 0.72, and the possible values of the random variable X are 0, 1, 2, up to 10. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use the formula that we had for binomial probabilities. So the probability of getting exactly 8 is 10 choose 8, 0 0.72 raised to the 8th power, 1 minus uh, 0 0.72 raised to the squared. Again, these two numbers always add up to 10, the two exponents. And so we have that. Uh, the definition of this is 10 factorial over 8 factorial times 10 minus 8 whole factorial. Uh, and you do that calculation and all the multiplies and you get this. Now you should, because I am going to expect you to have answers uh, to these numerical answers. So make sure that you can follow these calculations, but you get 0 0.2548 as the probability for digits. Now B asks, uh, what about fewer than three would give up their cell phone? Now fewer than three is the same thing as the probability that X, the random variable is less than three, and that's the probability of getting zero, one, or two. And that's the probability of zero plus the probability of one plus the probability of two because those are disjoint events. And each of these can be calculated by the formula. So this is 10 choose zero, 0.72 to the zero power, and this one to the 10th power. And this is 10 choose one, this is raised to the 1, that is raised to the 9, and this is 10 choose 2, that is raised squared, and that is raised to the 8. If you do all those calculations and add them together, you get this number. Part C asks, at least 3 would rather give up chocolate. So that means you're greater than or equal to 3. So the probability greater than or equal to 3 is... And again, you could do this by directly by computing probability of 3 plus probability of 4 plus dot, 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 all the way up to probability of 10, but that's a lot of work. And so this is actually easier if you use the complement rule. So the probability that x is bigger than or equal to 3 is equal to 1 minus the probability that x is less than 3, which is what we just calculated. So that's 1 minus that number, and we get this number for our answer. Uh, let's see, the number of adults who would be willing to give up chocolate uh, between 5 and 7. Okay, so you want the probability that x is between 5 and 7 and including the endpoints. So that means it's the probability of 5 or 6 or 7, and that means we add these probabilities together because they are all disjoint. I have these calculations, these numbers adding up to this. This is a great example of a kind of problem that you very well could be asked again. Okay, so here's another one. Now, this one, uh, in the way I copied it here, it says using the binomial table, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say, uh, do it the same way we did the other one, and I am going to use this to introduce some technology. So the problem says, according to a Gallup, uh, poll, 65% of adult Americans are in favor of the death penalty for individuals convicted of murder. 
in a uh, random sample of 15 adult Americans, what's the probability that exactly 10 favor the death penalty? Or, part B, what's the probability that no more than 6 favor the death penalty? You know what to do. Let's see how you did. Now I'm going to start talking a little bit about technology and we will work this, but you see you don't have to do all this by hand. You can use Excel. So the way you would do this in Excel, you could hit the, uh, so you'd be in a cell where you want the answer, and then you'll hit the FX button. Now the FX button will put the equal sign there, but then you're inserting a function. And so you could search on all, and what you're looking for now is the binomial dot distribution for the binomial distribution. And note that what this returns and what you, and your arguments of the function are going to be the number of successes, the number of trials, the probability of a success, and we call this x, n, and p respectively. And then you have to tell it if it's cumulative or not. We're not going to be doing cumulative, so that returns the individual term. So this will give us exactly if we put a zero in for there instead of a one. And then we would click OK, and we would uh, then get this dialog box that we would fill out. So we put the number of successes, number of trials, and so on and so forth. And then when we do that and we hit OK, the number would appear here. Let's look at how this would work then in our problem. Now up here, I just inputting um, some of the information that we have. So in our problem, n was 15. P was 0.65, that means 1 minus P is 0.35. I don't really need to put input this because Excel knows once you tell it it's a binomial that this is going to be 0.35. But I have it there anyway, and so I am going to be putting in. And you see, I'm going to fill out all the possibilities. So I'm going to get the uh, table for all of these values. So here uh, in this cell, I click F sub X. It puts in the equal sign, and I've chosen the binomial dot distribution function. So you see, I'm going to say, what's the uh, probability of getting zero successes? So I'm going to click on that one. So you see, I'm clicking on D3, and you see D3 is there. Now, in the next argument, though, I have to be aware that whenever I'm pulling this down, Excel changes where it's looking. So whenever I put the probability of uh, the number of trials, rather, excuse me, number of trials is next, I have to click on this, but this is an absolute reference. This is going to be dollar sign B, dollar sign 1. And then I have the probability of um, success, which is P. And again, I'm going to be pulling these down, so I have to use a fixed or absolute reference. So this is going to be uh, dollar sign B, dollar sign 2 for that one. And then I'm going to put a zero here always because I want exactly the number. And again, the cumulative says that if you want a cumulative uh, distribution, press true. We don't want that. We just want a probability mass function. So that is why we use false or zero. And then we hit OK. And you can see that when we hit OK, the formula result that's going to be here is 1.44 and so on and so forth. But this is times 10 to the minus 7. This is a really tiny number but it is bigger than zero. Okay, so, and I would hit okay, and uh, it would fill out the table. And so I get all of these numbers when I pull that function down. And here are the formulas that were pulled down for each one of those, but you can see that these are the numbers that I want. So you see, now I'm almost ready to answer the question. Recall that the question was, What's the probability of getting exactly 10? Well, the probability of getting exactly 10 is here, and so it is this number, 0.2123, and so on and so forth. And then the other question was, part B, what's the probability of getting at most 6? Well, those are these numbers here, because that means I get 6 or fewer. So I have to add up these probabilities, and when I do that, this is my sum function here, I get 0. 42194, uh, I guess. And uh, 
I could ask you, gee, given this distribution here, what is the mean and what is the standard deviation? Well, uh, and one thing, by the way, you can always test to see that this is a probability distribution by adding up the P of X's, but you do get one. They're all bigger than or equal to zero, and so we're good to go. That is a probability distribution. Now, the way we taught you in previous videos and in the um, uh, VCMs uh, to calculate the mean was you take X times P of X and add it up. And if you do that, you should get 9.75 as the mean. And we also gave you a formula for the standard deviation. You take x squared, and here I calculated x squared using Excel, and this is x squared times p of x, so I'm taking this column times the respective elements in this column and uh, adding them up, and I get this, and then I subtract the mean squared, which is down here. If I square that, I get this number. So I take this number minus this number, I get this number, and then I take the square root of that, and that is the standard deviation. Um, and again, I'm going beyond what the problem asks for here, but uh, it, I think this is a good place to do it. Notice that the mean, in this problem anyway, ends up being n times p. And the standard deviation ends up being the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. And again, you should verify all of these calculations. And you might say, is that an accident or not? And the answer is, no, it's not an accident. So if you have a binomial experiment within independent trials and a probability of success of p, then the mean and standard deviation are given by these formulas. So the mean of the random variable x is n times p, and the standard deviation is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. Now, if I were to plot this using scatter plots in Excel, here I'm plotting x, uh, x and p of x. The x is down here, and the p of x is the y. You get something like this, and you say, oh, it looks like a bell-shaped curve. And the bell-shaped curve is skewed uh, left. But you can kind of say, oh, that's looking a little bit like a normal distribution, except here it's not skewed this way. Uh, in fact, why don't you do some of those graphs? Here's another problem. And graph uh, the binomial probabilities using the scatterplot function in Excel for n equal 10 and p equal uh, 0.2. Comment on the shape and then do it for n is 10 p equal 0.5 and n equal 10, p equal 0.8, and comment on the shape of the distribution in each case. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. Well, you should have generated these uh, numbers here uh, for, the, uh, for the first case. I think that was p equals um, uh, point, uh, 0.2. And you notice you get this, and here it's skewed right, but still it's a bell-shaped kind of curve. If you use p equal 0.5, you get this, and you see, wow, that one is really symmetric. And if you let p equal, I think it was p equal 0.8, you get it skewed left. So you see there is a connection between the binomial distribution and the normal curve. And in fact, it wouldn't, it's not going to surprise you that the central limit theorem tells you exactly what this relationship is. And so we notice that, uh, let's see here, I'm just repeating myself. I think this was uh, p equal 0.02. It's skewed this way. It's symmetric when p is equal to, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm doing something different here. Hold on. Uh, so we've seen that it's skewed right if p is less than 0.5. It's symmetric if p equal 0.5, and it's skewed left if p is greater than 0.5. Now, we've seen the role that p plays, but what happens with n? And you see if we let n get uh, bigger, here is n is 10, here n is 30, 
and here n is 70, and you see it starts getting more and more symmetric the bigger n does. And so what really happens is, this again is an illustration that the central limit theorem, as n gets larger and larger, uh, it becomes more and more symmetric, and it converges to a normal distribution. And again, this is one instance of the central limit theorem. It's not the only one, but is one interest, uh, one instance of the central limit theorem. And uh, here we're kind of making that conclusion that we say for fixed P, as the number of trials increases, the probability distribution becomes bell-shaped. And as a rule of thumb, you have to have N times P times 1 minus P be bigger than or equal to 10 for you to be able to use this distribution. So um, this allows us to use the empirical rule. And we can talk about uh, that uh, if it was good enough to use a normal approximation, 95% of all observations will lie between two standard deviations of the mean. And a lot of times, um, when I've taught this book, uh, course, uh, this is the first time I've actually done it differently, chapter 7.4 in the Sullivan book addresses this, and it involves us testing for a binomial uh, distribution. We test to see if this condition is satisfied. Then we do a normal calculation, but then we have to do something called a continuity correction. This term, I decided to do it without this correction, and so we're uh, not going to do this. We're going to do the binomial probabilities, but we'll do them this way. Um, we then, in this course, this term, We'll focus on finding the exact answer using Excel, not doing an approximation here. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. May God bless you all.